Hi, how you doing? I'm Senior Pastor Charlie Coker of Identity Church. I want to tell you about a school that I prepared. It's called Kingdom School. We do it at 9 a.m. Sunday mornings. I pick seven different teachers out of our body that I believe are anointed and called by God to explain the kingdom, how it functions, how it works. Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Come join us. They work for three weeks at a time. I'm very tight on my subject matter, and they're anointed from God. Please join us. Good morning. Good morning. School. Good morning. <laughs> and a very special happy birthday to our very own elder, Rodney. <laughs> Rodney's not here. Happy birthday, Randy. look a lot alike. Holy Spirit. Yeah, there you go. May this year be a year of abundance for you in every area of your life. Thank you. Amen. So I was going to ask Gary to pray for us because I was not going to take a birthday boy, but since he's not here, Pastor Pam, let you know, open us in prayer. Okay, sure. Father, we just thank you for your goodness, your mercy, and your grace, Father. And we thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit have his way during this time. And Lord, may you be revealed more and more as we go into the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Well, um, again, the title of what we've been talking about last week and this week is Adjusting Our Lenses. And so last week, some of the things that we talked about was what is the filter that we often use and how is that affecting us and are there adjustments that we need to make? And we ended on kind of a heavy note because of where I was taking us to see the negatives. Today, we're switching gears, and we're going to look at the fruit, that when we make the proper lens adjustment, what's the fruit that comes from that? Amen. I think we need to make a heat adjustment. A heat adjustment? <laughs> we're a little, it's a little, cold. It's a little chilly in here. <laughs> <laughs> so I have numerous things to read to you. I hope we'll have time to, for dialogue, but um, I, I just think this is, for me, it, it was good. It was um, revealing to me. So I hope that feel the same way. So we're going to look at five examples from scripture. We don't know her name or age, but her conversation with the Lord is the longest one-on-one -on -one chat recorded in scripture. This is reason enough to give our sister from Samaria a fresh look. We're talking about the woman at the well. It was high noon on a hot day. Jesus was tired from traveling, so he chose a sensible rest stop, Jacob's Well, outside the town of Sychar. And while waiting for his disciples to go down into town for food, he met an unnamed woman who appeared with a clay jar in her hand. And Jesus made just a simple request. Will you give me a drink? Uh-oh. Lens adjustment. Jews were not supposed to speak to Samaritans. Lens adjustment. Men are not permitted to address women without their husbands present. Lens adjustment. The rabbis had no business speaking to shady ladies such as this one. Yet Jesus was willing to toss out all the rules. But the woman at the well wasn't. You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman, she reminded him. How can you ask me for a drink? Her filter was the law. The Lord's filter was grace. This was an offer she couldn't refuse. And he began, if you knew the gift of God, the moment we hear, hear the word if, we make a lens adjustment. This one simple word caused her to sense, here's a tantalizing invitation with a gift included. This is truly an irresistible offering. Instead of insisting she pour him a drink, the Lord offered her living water. Lens adjustment. Water from the ground was common, but living water? Now we had her attention. This polite, the gutsy woman pointed out the obvious. You have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. 
Where can you get this living water? Her natural curiosity, just like ours, prompts us to ask questions. This is no cause for, ner for nervousness because Jesus knows how to handle all of our doubts and our disbelief. To quench her spiritual thirst, the Lord first confessed the truth about plain H2O. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But then Jesus made a bold promise. Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. In one sentence, he shifted everything from everyday life to everlasting life. This was a time for this girl to make a leap of faith. But was she ready? Not quite. She wanted what he was offering, but only so she could avoid returning to the well for water. So now the Lord intervened, speaking the truth in love. Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. This wasn't an odd request, since again, women were not to be conversing alone with man in a public place. But Jesus' request was more about uncovering the truth than following the rules of society. When she confessed, I have no husband, Jesus affirmed her answer and then gently exposed her sin. The fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. Think about this. Five husbands did not make her a sinner. Due to warfare, famine, disease, and injury, men in those days dropped like flies. A widow became either a beggar, a prostitute, or another man's wife. Each time this woman chose the best option. I never thought of it in that way before. We always think of her as living with someone that she's not married to. When you understand the context of the times, it shifts our lens. Then he goes, he goes in and he says, but sharing her bed with a sixth man who wasn't her husband, that was sin. Did she fess up? Nope, she changed the subject. <laughs> Jesus talked about worship, Jerusalem, the difference between Jews, Jews and Samaritans. And again, we get her eva evasion, religion versus relationship. Finally, the woman at the well did her best to shut Jesus down, saying, well, when the Messiah comes, he will explain everything to us. How stunned she must have been with this lens change. When Jesus began, I who speak to you am he. The next moment, the arrival of his followers confirmed his identity and gave the woman time to process the truth. Wow, the anointed one has come. Overjoyed, she leaves her water jar, goes back into town, and urges her neighbors, come see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? With all of these lens changes, what was the result? The whole town was saved and saw Jesus as the Christ for the first time. I find it interesting as I was studying that, that it says that the disciples came and met up with Jesus. So they were witnessing everything that he was doing and talking to a Samaritan woman, how he was dealing with her. And I thought, did any of the disciples remember what they had just witnessed? Had their lenses been changed by experiencing how the Lord treated this woman and the fruit that came from it? I think that Peter, for one, was still stuck until he got a personal lens adjustment. We all remember the story of Peter's sheet vision. The sheet comes down three times, and you know the Lord's telling him, kill, eat. He's like, you know, oh, I've never touched anything unclean. And in verse 28 of Acts 10, Peter, as he gets the revelation, says to those he's speaking to, 
You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. With that next lens adjustment, the gospel is now spreading for the first time to the ends of the earth. Okay, a few other lens adjustments. I love um, the story from Elijah. And um, in 1 Kings 18.4, Elijah says to Ahab, Go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the town of Mark Carmel. He bowed himself down on the earth, put his face between his knees, and then he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. He went up and looked and said, There's nothing. He looks again, and again. Seven times he goes and looks, and only on the seventh time he says, Behold, a little cloud the size of a man's hand is rising from the sea. Did he see rain yet? Did he hear what Elijah had heard? No. All he saw at that point was the little cloud. And what does Elijah say? Go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And it hadn't even started to rain, and yet, there was a lens adjustment. Were they going to obey? And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Elijah heard the sound of rain, and yet it took seven times of looking, sending a servant to see before the manifestation of what was heard was revealed in the natural. So do we doubt sometimes what we've heard because we have not seen it yet? To look seven times for completion. <laughs> well, yeah, is a filter right. of doubt sometimes getting in our way? The Word says in Hebrews 11, 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. Many times we get in the way of seeing the fulfillment from impatience, doubt, unbelief, call it, call it what you want. <laughs> Another story from Elijah that I really like is um, from 2 Kings, chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. It says, When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? He's seeing truth, but through his natural eyes. What's Elijah say to him? Don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elijah prayed and said, O oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. So I think this is a great example of seeing in the natural, and then through prayer, having our eyes opened to see what God is doing in the Spirit. I just think that's such a great example of God supplying our needs. He brings his army answers our prayers, and fights for us. It's a different men's adjustment, too. Instead of doing a men's adjustment in the natural, you have to do a men's adjustment in the spiritual. Exactly. Well, and think of, with all of those stories, it was connecting what we see in the natural to what is God doing in the spirit and making that adjustment. So um, the last one we're going to look at is the story of Jonah. And when I Googled this, what came up, it was a very interesting. I said, why did Jonah try to go to Tarshish, Tarshish instead of Nineveh? 
The word of the Lord came to Jonah with a command to preach against the wickedness of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian kingdom. However, Jonah chose to flee from the presence of the Lord instead. In his flight, Jonah left his home of Gath Hepher near Nazareth in Israel and traveled to Joppa, a coastal city, where he boarded a ship bound for Tarshish, a city near Gibraltar in the southern part of Spain. The contrast between Nineveh, where he was supposed to go, and Tarshish, where he went, was vast. Nineveh was located east of the Tigris River in modern-day Iraq. It was more than 500 miles east of Jonah's hometown. In contrast, Tarshish stood more than 2,500 miles from Israel in the opposite direction of Nineveh. It was the most remote destination available to Jonah. Jonah was trying to put as much distance as he could between himself <coughs> and the Assyrians. Whatever happened in Nineveh, Jonah did not want to be there to see it. Did he need a lens adjustment? No. Yeah. Jonah's reason <laughs> for running was that, quite simply, he didn't like the Assyrians. The Assyrians were idolatrous, proud. They were a ruthless nation bent on world conquest and had long been a threat to Israel. God was sending Jonah as a missionary to the capital. Yet Nineveh, a prophet, fought. At the end of the story, Jonah specifies his reason for the resistance. That is why I was clicked to flee, to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. In other words, Jonah wanted Nineveh to be destroyed. He felt they deserved God's judgment. Jonah didn't want to see God's mercy extended to his enemies, and yet he knew in his heart that it was God's intention to show mercy. Through this lens adjustment, Jonah discovered that God's salvation is available to all who repent, not just to those who we, or in this case, Jonah, would choose. What I walked away from that is something that we had talked about um, one day here at church, of the freedom and salvation that's available if there is the fruit of repentance. So I think all of these are great examples of, of lens adjustments. As I said last week, remember, if you want to change, the first thing you have to do, do is change your perspective on this. So we, ask, we need to be asking the right questions. Have we evaluated ourselves? Have we evaluated the situations in our life correctly? The bottom line is we need to get God's perspective and ask things like, well, what is wrong with how I see things? Where do I need to make change? Are you even redirecting my course? Do I have the right people speaking into my life? Or do I have too many naysayers versus those that are the iron sharpening the iron? And as Pastor Charlie had shared a couple weeks ago, am I listening to a mocking spirit and don't even realize it because I perceive that what I'm hearing is true when it's not? When Pastor Charlie spoke of that, I, I realized um, something that often we make comparisons. We have a comparison standard. Whose plumb line are we using? Whose measuring rod are we using? And I had a great example of this um, back in, as I was preparing this, the Lord reminded me back in Colorado, um, the church that we were in, we had one um, paid counselor on staff. And she died unexpectedly, like within a week's time from a brain aneurysm. 
So the church was in a panic because more women come for counseling, usually, than men do. And yet the church was staffed by men. So all the pastors on staff were willing to do counseling, but they were not allowed to do counseling without a woman in the room with them if they were going to be ministering to a woman. So they would try to use their wives, but so many of the wives either worked or had young children at home and weren't available. So the church was like, okay, we've got a list of people waiting for counseling. What are we going to do? So they tasked one of the um, women in the church to put together a team that um, they didn't need to be professional counselors. They were going to be searching to find someone to bring on staff. But in the meantime, we've got a gap to fill here. So um, the woman that was tasked with this was told pick five women and then pick five more to assist them and have them take up the slack until we could hire someone. So I was one of the women that um, they were picked <coughs> and I had an assistant with me and um, I, in this case I was in the lead and I had a, a female counselor prayer counselor is what they called us, since we, none of us were legally accredited to counsel. And <coughs> her job as my assistant was to be praying for me, to hear what the Lord wanted done, and praying for the person that we were ministering to, to be able to receive. And because we worked together, we needed to have a very close relationship where she knew my strengths, but she also knew my weaknesses. So that at any time if we needed to shift, she could take the lead and I would step back. So when the woman came in for counseling and told us what her issue was, we could not even look at each other, the, the other prayer minister and I, because she knew that this was hidden an area in me. And it was like, okay, God, I, I had seen enough to know that whoever was assigned to come to me for counseling, it was a God divine appointment. So I had no doubt that God had set this up, but I was going to need a lens adjustment. So we were able to minister to this woman, and what happened was after she left, the other prayer minister and I just looked at each other and just burst out laughing. She's like, oh, how did you get through that? And I said, you know, I said, it was amazing because she came with an issue that was the exact opposite of the issue I had in my marriage. And yet, when I heard her heart, oh, the compassion just flowed out of me and I received as much ministry as that woman did because I realized there's two ways to look at every situation. So the bottom line there is we're each on our own journey. How things look for you and how they look for me are different. The steps that you need to take, they, they're for you, but they may not be for me. This is a case where one side does not fit all. So, do we need to adjust our lenses for clarity? I think we're in a place where we need to be focusing on what is my assignment. Remember I started this whole thing with I asked the Lord, what is your will for me? What is your perfect will for me? Our assignments change several times throughout our walk in life. And so as I asked, Lord, what is your perfect will for me now? Now the next step is to get the Lord's timing on this. So I'm asking you to ask yourself, who's the Lord of your time? Mm -hmm. And what are you focusing on? And how the Lord first revealed this whole time thing to me was um, when I first got the revelation of tithing. And my heart immediately was like, we're generous givers, but we're not tithers. And I was convicted. But because in my marriage, my husband managed and controlled 
let's just be frank, all the money, I really didn't have a voice other than in prayer. And so I asked the Lord to speak to my husband, to give him a revelation on this, to change his heart. But in the meantime, I was like, how do I? My heart's already there, but I don't have a voice. What do I do? And so as I presented that to the Lord, the Lord said to me, well, what do you have to give me? Just my mind just was scrambled because I'm thinking money. And as I sat before the Lord, it's like, well, what do I have to give you? And all of a sudden it hit me, time. I've got time to give you. And then the way Karen thinks, I was like, okay, so I'm going to tithe my time to the Lord. Do I tithe my waking hours? <laughs> <laughs> then it became the issue of am I tithing on the gross or on the net? And I heard the Lord very clearly because He said, "Well, how much time do I give you each day?" Okay, I get the message. There was so much fruit in that when I realized that, and the Lord miraculously gave me the strength and the ability to. Never neglect any of the other things that I was to be doing that were good in taking care of my family, my husband, my children, volunteering, doing things at church, but to spend quality time with the Lord. I never thought I could read, I, I have done several times the Bible in a year. I read the whole Bible in three months. That had never happened in my whole, that may have been the first time that I had ever read every you know, book of the Bible. So God's placement for us can mean a lens adjustment. Ask, and this is where we ask questions. Okay, Lord, if this is where you're placing me, how do you see this? Is this where you've called me? Am I using my gift to advance the kingdom? Or even am I anointed? to do this. Something that Brad and I have talked about before of are we operating from our gift or from our anointing? That was something that tweaked me when I, I was like, I don't know if I've ever thought about that. And as I processed that with the Lord, I could easily see the difference in my life as I reviewed of when I was operating from the anointing. I could be on my feet ministering for hours, not tired, come home, still so wound up, on fire. That was the anointing that enabled the gift to flow at that level. Mm -hmm. So as I was thinking about this, I, I was reminded of a time when I um, was working at the Pentagon, and several of the guys that I worked with um, were fighter pilots, and a few of them were the elite of the fighter pilots. They were Thunderbirds, former Thunderbirds. Now they were stationed at the Pentagon. Well, I had the privilege of um, being given a day off from work to go to an air show with the former Thunderbirds. So talk about some lens adjustments. <clears throat> They met me at the Pentagon, and we rode together to um, where the air show was. Well, when they met me, I was used to seeing them in their work attire. And, you know, they always had to wear a uniform, so, you know, basically suit and tie. Type. Well, because they were former Thunderbirds and we were going to an air show, they were allowed to wear their flight suits. Woo-wee. <laughs> I'm looking at all these nice guys that I'm working with, and it's like, wow, this is a big lens change. And so they were so excited, you know, because one, they were away from, you know, desk, desk work. And so they were taking me, and it's like, Karen, yeah, this is the plane that I used to fly. And they're telling me, they're even allowing me, in a few instances, we could climb up into the cockpit. And I could see, you know, how tight it was, and all the instrumentation and everything, and, and I was noticing on the sides of the planes um, their names and that, and it would have, like, say, um, one of them was uh, Major Judd Blaisdell, 
And then underneath, in quotes, it said RIP. And as we were walking around, people would come up and they'd be like, Hey, Torque! Good to see you again! Speedy! What's going on? I'm like, what? this is a whole new language. Well, what I came to understand was in flight school, they came up with nicknames based on a gift that they were seeing operate in these guys. So Speedy obviously was fast. Torque pulled a lot of torque. Rip, I, I guess he's ripping through the skies. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and as they were, were, you know, taking me around, it they would introduce me to other people, and they'd be like, this, "He's my wingman. He flew slot." And I'm like, I mean, all of these were new terms to me, and yet I could tell as they were speaking others, these were, this was an accolade. You know, it's like, not just, this is a form of, this one right here, my wingman. Because this one over here, they pulled slot. And so I'm, I'm just seeing all of their excitement, and it was reminding me of, of days back in the office when I'd be sitting in, you know, my central area, and and all the guys were in offices, kind of like behind me, so that if anybody came in, they went through me as as the secretary before they could get to the guys. And I would hear them back in the office with all this commotion and all this, <laughs> you know, and be like, "What is going on back there?" And I walk back one day, and they're all taking their desks and they're just shaking them like like crazy, and they're like, "We can't get this desk off the ground." <laughs> They were, be true. they were frustrated <laughs> because they were still viewing themselves through the lens of a fighter pilot, which was where they were gifted, but the Lord had put them in a new position. They were now in the Pentagon to develop training, tactics, strategies to train the next generation of elite pilots. So... I share all that to say that as we are stepping into new assignments, we need to change our perspective of even how the Lord used us in the past versus how he wants to use us now. It's a, it's a matter of understanding our identity and how God wants to use us in the kingdom. I think a, another great example is with Moses. In the very beginning, Moses says in Exodus 6.30, but Moses argued with the Lord saying, I can't do it. I'm such a clumsy speaker. Why would Pharaoh listen to me? The Lord needed to adjust Moses' ability to see what he was anointed to do, what he was called to do, what his place was in the kingdom. And then another adjustment Later on, which we've talked about before, is as he stepped into that role, he was doing it all. And Jethro has to come along and say, uh, you've got a team here. A great example of that we've shared before is elders being placed in the body. So I think it's critical for where we're going to understand that Jesus is constantly going to change our lives. And it's going to mess with what we think we know. Sometimes we even need to throw traditions out the window where we say, but well, we've always done it this way. I like to say that when we get a new way of thinking, we need to throw out our stinking thinking. All of these things, these changes, they make us uncomfortable. Hasn't the Lord given us the greatest gift of all, besides our salvation, of course? The Holy Spirit is our great. Would you agree that if we're going to have to look at ourselves with a different lens, that we're also going to have to look at others and not look at them in the same place that they that they were at and Most see the growth? Because if we're not honoring those around us, how are we? We're going to be the only one growing, and, and which is that's right. Exactly. Great right. point. Yeah, it's a, so it's, it's a personal lens adjustment for ourselves and then a lens adjustment with all of those that we're called to serve and come alongside in the body of life. 
think that would hinder you. Oh yeah, if you don't. It definitely hinder if you, you don't. Your, your, yeah, if you don't adjust for yourself yeah. and seeing others in a different way. Right. Well, sometimes things get in the way of that bitterness, jealousy, etc. So we're all on the same team. Yeah. Right. We're all on God's team. That's right. Mm -hmm. it becomes the devil's standard. Yeah. Right. Right. So, as I had shared last week, in adjusting and changing our lenses, some of the questions, think about this metaphorically. Do we need to be cleansed? Do we need to have our lenses repaired? Do we need new ones? Do they need to be replaced? <laughs> You know, a couple, a couple examples that Pastor Charlie gave on this was, remember him telling a story of, um, fairly recently about going to visit his dad, and when he, just before he left, he found the lens from his dad's glass near a kick plate, and so he just picked it up and left it on the counter, and later on his dad calls him and, and says, did you put that there? And, and he had he had said, it's like, I've been praying. It's like, Lord, send an angel, something. You know, it's like, help me find this lens. And he, and he joked, he says, I guess I didn't wait long enough. I've already ordered a new pair of glasses. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but think about that. If you go back and recall what the conversation was that Pastor Charlie was having with his dad, was his dad was struggling because so many of the prisons there were closing. And his dad started to ask the questions, well, what am I supposed to be doing now? His dad was in a place of not only a lens adjustment, but new lenses. There's a, there's a new assignments coming. <coughs> Um, and getting back the old one at the same time, maybe I'm multiplying. Right. Yeah. Because right. sometimes the old one works once it's been cleansed and put back in. And, and put back in. So it, you know, another example that um, Charlie gave, and I don't remember the whole story behind this, but um, he was saying how in a congregation they had a millionaire. And so when there were things that needed to be done, the mentality was, you've got a millionaire here, let him finance it. But the truth of what I remember Pastor Charlie saying it is, they realized, yeah, he's got the means, but that is not his job. That's not what we're calling him to sow his finances. That needs to come from another place. So there again, we need to change our perspective of, oh, but... Mary Ann's always done that. We'll just let Mary Ann take care of it. Take care of it. I second that. Sometimes we need to adjust our lenses. Is it? Is this still the season for her to be doing that? Or does the Lord have a new assignment and somebody else can pick up that element? That's true for all of us. I've just you know, picked Mary Ann out. And, and so I... I think that, for me, I sense that these are things that the Lord is doing here at Identity Church. So let me kind of end with this. Um, let's keep our focus on what God's called us to do. Gary had shared one day when he was doing the, um, the offering if I remember right, it was the coach of the Super Bowl who had three words. Do your job. Do your job. So, I think we need to stay in the position, understand our position, stay in that position, and maintain our focus. And if we're struggling with our assignment, Maybe we need to ask ourselves, why am I struggling? Am I overcommitted? Have I taken on too much? 
Are there some things that I need to, do I need to have a to-do list and a not-to-do list? Sometimes it's not your job. <laughs> well, that would then become on the not-to-do list when we're picking up things that we don't need to pick up that are really hindering us from walking mm -hmm. in the fullness of what God's called us to do. Um, for me, some of the questions I've had to ask over my life is, am I stuck because I'm either enabling or I'm codependent or I'm working so much on their problem when it's their problem. Yeah, that's true. It is not mine mm -hmm. to do. And so I'm wasting a lot of physical, emotional energy, a lot of time. So I sense that we're in a time like in Nehemiah where they were building the wall. Where they built with one hand and they fought with another. I think this is, for me, it's a great example. I always go back to some, some military terms when the guys were introducing their wingman. A wingman is the person that flies next to you. So the person on the wall next to us, they've got their tools, they're doing their job, they've got their sword, you know, they're fighting any battle that comes, but they're also there to fight if something's coming alongside you that's going to hinder you, they're there. To me, that's a great picture of the body working together. So we each have our assignment, but we're linking arms and helping the next person. They're still doing their assignment. It's not for me to do what Pam is to do, but it is for me to stand alongside her and encourage her and help her, and if anything's coming at her, to be a rear guard and, and you know, fight with her. So recently, as I was praying about this, I heard the Lord speak a military term to me. I'm used to, but this was, um, I'm kind of used to Air Force <laughs> terms. And what I heard the Lord say is, it's time to man the battle station. So I looked it up on the internet, and it's, it's a Navy term. It says, it's a sound that all sailors recognize. A loud, insistent gong sounding over the PA system of the ship. And then they yell out, General Quarters, General Quarters, all hands, man your battle stations. This sound causes the sailors' adrenaline to flow as they switch into combat mode. This call to general quarters means they drop whatever they're doing, they don their battle gear, and they sprint. Seconds count, and performing their tasks the right way during moments of absolute chaos can mean the difference between safety and swimming. So... Pretty good timing. <laughs> My encouragement for each of us is let's adjust our lens. Let's find our place, man our station, and do what God's called us to do in the anointing that he's given us so that we can affect the kingdom. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church. To know more about us, go to identitychurch.net, where you'll find resources such as a calendar, media, and upcoming events. You may also download an app for your mobile device from the Apple App Store or Google Play. Then from your mobile device, you can hear our messages, read from the Bible, take notes, connect with us on the social media, and even pay your tithe. Again, thank you for tuning in to today's message from Identity Church.